Rosinda, and thank you very much for inviting me to be here. It's a real pleasure to be able to discuss this work with you. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a, a new project uh, that I'm, I've been working on with uh, Agnes norris Keller, who is at the IFS, and Fabienne Postavinet, who is at UCL, at IFS as well. And I'm going to talk about uh, the careers and wages of women around childbirth, in particular in relation to uh, labor supply, sorting into different types of jobs and uh, the accumulation of human capital. Uh, so this project is uh, motivated by a um, well-known fact that uh, well, has been reported both for the UK and around the world, which is that the wages of women uh, relative to the wages of men uh, have stopped converging uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. And this is very much a feature uh, or a result of the progression of the wages of women and men over the course of life. So these uh, graphs here show uh, four different levels of education using data from the UK, in particular the BHPS and the USAC data put together, uh, what happens over the, uh, the age group uh, of between 20 and 50 year olds um, to the hourly wage rates uh, of uh, women and men. And uh, these are measured in real terms. Um, in uh, I think 2013 prices and what you see is that in here in um, in dark uh, green uh, the wages of men uh, pro continue progress over the life cycle um, from you know a relatively lower um, level um, for those with lower levels of education uh, when they start and a relatively small gap uh, relative to the wages of women uh, there is a strong and expected gradient with uh, education, but across all uh, education groups, what we see is that the wages of men continue progressing over the life cycle uh, relatively healthily. Now, as for women, however, they start, as I said, in all educational groups very close to what men um, earn, but after uh, a 10 years in the labor market, their wages essentially flatten out and there is no more progression. <coughs> By the way, I should um, um, highlight that these are hourly wages, so in all cases, uh, throughout the presentation, I'm always going to talk about hourly wages and not earnings. Uh, so we have uh, for a long time associated uh, the, the lack of progression in wages uh, of women with childbirth. Uh, and these, uh, actually these graphs here show again by level of education. These are the same levels of education I've plotted before, except I now call them secondary, high school and university. I'm going to do this for the rest of the presentation. Um, what we see here is what happens around the birth of the first child, here indicated by this um, um, vertical line. So this is one year uh, before birth and when the child is zero uh, is just after uh, that vertical line. And again, now we look at wages. I'm, I'm now, from now on, just plotting log wages instead of um, wages in levels just because then when I'm comparing it's easier as uh, differences in logs are similar to uh, our approximation to percentage uh, point differences. And so what we see around the birth of the first child for all groups is that, well, the wages of men continue progressing, you know, f much more strongly for more educated men than for the lower uh, education group. The wages of women, however, who have which have remained more or less, um, you know, a, a, a parallel prior to the first birth, start dropping uh, once the birth uh, is realized. And they don't seem to, to ever converge back to uh, the level of wages of men, uh, at least uh, after 15 years uh, of this first birth. And so what I do now is, okay, so let's suppose that uh, we, um, we normalize the difference before birth to zero, and so we essentially we move uh, these um, um, curves to, top, to, to be on top of each other just before birth, and then we compare how uh, the, the differences in these two curves um, evolve after the birth of the first child to see uh, how the wage gap actually opens um, after the first birth. And these graphs here show exactly that. So we controlling for age, there are some age differences in terms of when the first birth occurs, and controlling for the region when these individuals uh, um, live, we now compare the difference in the wage rates in logs of uh, women and men around the, the first birth. And we see that prior, for the secondary educated, prior to birth, there are not, uh, you know, there is no change in the difference, essentially, from that uh, 
first year prior to birth. But then after birth, these change, the, 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 the wages of women gain much less than the wages of men, or essentially drop. And the difference actually opens to around almost 20% or even more than 20% for more uh, for uh, uh, high educated uh, groups uh, after 15 years. Effectively, by the, the time the child is about 10, there is already uh, about a 20% gap in the wages of men and women. So what we also notice from this figure, uh, which is, I think, uh, worth highlighting, is that there is no sudden opening of the gap. The gap opens gradually over time. So it's, there is something uh, happening to the wages of men and women, or in particular to the wages of women, at that point that uh, seems to build up over time uh, in um, worsening their relative position in the labor market. Now, in the past, we have associated this opening of the gender pay gap with what happens to the, the labor supply of women and what happens to the hours, so in terms of employment, both employment and hours. This graph here shows, or this set of graphs here show, uh, these, uh, uh, these results. So it shows that women uh, who, before giving birth to their first child, are working at levels which effectively are very similar to those of men in the 90% uh, uh, year over, are in employment. After the first birth, actually, their uh, employment rates uh, drop very, very uh, strongly uh, to about 50% for the less educated, much more, uh, um, so much more uh, employment for the more educated uh, women, but still uh, by about uh, 15 to 20%. This is now Sorry, I can speak up, but <laughs> yeah. Oops. So this is what happens to employment. What happens to part-time uh, is uh, conditional unemployment is exactly the reverse. So women who now work, they are mostly working in part-time jobs. In particular, the lower educated women are working in 50% of the workers who are only 50% of the total population of part-time work, of, of, uh, uh, an, of women um, in low education, are now uh, taking uh, part-time jobs. And part-time jobs for me is uh, working between um, uh, five and 25 hours per week. Anything above 25 hours per week will be full-time employment. The, again, women of more education respond less, but also in very significant levels. So when we took this together, uh, the, these changes in labor supply uh, together to try to understand what is the, their overall role uh, in terms of explaining the opening of the gender pay gap after 20 years of the child's uh, uh, birth. Uh, th so the, for uh, the different educational groups we have uh, that the, by, by the time the, the child is 20, the gender pay gap has uh, opened by about 20 to 25 percentage points. And if we take the role of experience, employment and part-time uh, work in terms of uh, trying to explain this gap, we see that we explain uh, about a third uh, of that opening gap uh, for secondary uh, educated individuals, uh, more than 50% for the more educated individuals. That is, they respond less, but experience and employment seems to be uh, a much more uh, stronger predictor uh, of their wages than for the secondary uh, educated individuals. This is no news. We knew that uh, experience is very complementary to education, so experience is more valuable for individuals who have more education, and this just confirms this. And these numbers here are actually from past work that we have done both using economic models and using uh, sort of regression uh, type of analysis, and they are very consistent uh, with one another. Okay, so this we found in the past, in work that is now published. Uh, what we now want to do is to explore something different. What we want to uh, look at, you know, we want to bring into the equation two other factors that may help explaining uh, the rise uh, in these differences uh, in the uh, wages of men and women. So we want to bring into the equation, in particular, job location and the occupational sorting uh, of women uh, across different uh, types of jobs. The idea is actually very simple. We think that uh, if women uh, all of a sudden, after childbirth, uh, value their time um, 
and they face very high demands on their time and therefore value their time in a different way from what they do, from what they did prior to childbirth, then uh, they may want to respond to that change in the value of their time, both by adjusting how much they work and where they work. And the two are likely to be related. So travel time takes time. It's also costly. It, it's also risky because you don't know how much time you, can, you may be taking to come back home if you need to be there quickly. And therefore, uh, you may want to reduce the time uh, that you take on traveling uh, to be able to attend to the other demands of your time that they may have at home. Okay? They are likely related, how much they work and uh, where they work, because I if traveling too far uh, is now uh, more costly, then it is only justified if they work enough. That is, if you work far, you're potentially more likely to work more hours to justify the carrying that cost of actually having to travel far. They may also drive the choice of occupation. Uh, and through the choice of occupation, how much human capital women uh, accumulate in their jobs. So if women now are restricting their, uh, th their uh, uh, op the options of jobs that they are willing to accept to a narrower um, circle around their homes uh, with, for which they uh, travel faster, uh, then they may be limiting the type of job offers that they are, they are willing to accept if the, the, the jobs that they have on offer in their local area are not a you know, random sample of all the jobs that they may have, they are perhaps more targeted to low-skilled occupations or so, then they are actually compromising the type of jobs that they can get to uh, stay closer to home. And these may have immediate impacts on the types of jobs and therefore the return to work uh, um, contemporaneously, but also in term, uh, which uh, may affect their uh, skill accumulation and therefore the wage capacity they have in the future. So we expect not only that the type of jobs that they may uh, find is going to be different, they may actually move to downgrade their, uh, the type of occupations that they get and we'll have uh, these um, uh, dynamic effects uh, of skill mismatch through uh, the uh, accumulation of human capital and therefore wage stagnation. And, you know, in our project, well, we will also consider uh, that they may interact with incentives uh, created by taxes and benefits, even though today I'm not going to talk about this. So what I'm going to do today is to tell you a little bit about uh, how these uh, various uh, dimensions interact. I'm going to use USOC uh, data and BHPS to document the patterns uh, of uh, careers uh, that women take around childbirth, so how they change when the first, uh, with the arrival of the first child and in relation to job location. And in particular, I'm going to look at, well, first of all, travel to work time. I'm going to, to tell you a little bit about this, in particular because, you know, for economists, I think this is news. I'm sure that others, uh, geographers and so on, have, have, worked, have looked at this before, but I don't think it has been very much um, related to the sort of economic outcomes that we typically look at. And then I'm going to relate these to employment, earnings and occupations uh, to try to understand uh, how, you know, what's the source uh, of, um, to what extent is this related and can be a, uh, help as a, uh, understanding the opening of the gender pay gap. I must say that you know, I'm, what I'm going to do is very much on the sort of the data side, I'm going to describe what these patterns are. This is part of a larger project uh, where we develop an economic model to try to uh, understand these four dimensions together and to try to understand and measure exactly what consequences they have in, terms, in the long term for the wages of women. Okay. So I'm not, I don't need to talk, tell you about the data. Uh, everyone here knows what PHPS and USOC is. I'm using uh, the panels up to 2017. And, uh, and the, the only thing that I want to highlight, which is sort of different from you know, other uses that economic, uh, economists have done of this data, is that I'm going to actually look quite in quite detail to this geographical location of where the individuals live and the travel to work time. Um, just in terms of the sample selection that I'm going to use, uh, I am going to focus on, uh, well, women uh, between the ages of 22 and 50 who have left full-time education and don't, do not come back to, into education um, in, in, uh, during the period that I observe them, 
who never report claiming a disability benefit, so I'm looking, uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be concerned with um, health issues, and who are not self-employed or retired over this period. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, commuting time to start with. So I have, uh, uh, you know, just to, to show how important this may or may not be, uh, this was actually a bit surprising to me, uh, um, so there might be to other members of the audience. Uh, again, by education, all my analysis is going to be by education, except when I don't have a big enough sample to do it. Uh, when I look by education uh, uh, and, and just inspect what, you know, average um, level of commuting is am among the uh, mothers, uh, sorry, actually this is all women, among women who work, what we see is that um, there is a gradient with education uh, and it, the mean uh, travel time to work, this is one, one go, one direction, uh, varies between about 20 minutes and 30 minutes on average, uh, with some variation. Now, how long or short this is depends on how much they work. Uh, and here I'm assuming that they work uh, five days per week, which might not be the case, but that's the assumption that I'm using. And if that's true, then the working women uh, work in between almost six and almost seven hours per week, which means that actually commuting time is ex not, n n it's not very long, but it's not a, a um, insignificant proportion of the time, overall time that women dedicate to work in, and, and varies between 10% of the and 15% of the total uh, amount of uh, working time, including, um, including commuting uh, that they spend. Okay, so it's not insignificant and, and so it, it, they may react to it. Now what happens to commuting time around the uh, birth of the child? Now these images here uh, present uh, in minutes the travel to work time of men and women uh, around the birth of the first child and what you see, notice is that it's incredibly similar to what happens to the wages around the same period. What we see is that there is the, 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 the levels are more similar and relatively parallel prior to birth. And then after birth, what happens is that women's travel time to work actually drops uh, again uh, gradually over time, while the debt of men tends to stay more or less the same or even increase for the more educated um, individuals. If we look at the gaps, the gaps look almost exactly the same as the gaps in the gender, uh, in the pay gap. What we see is that a gap, again, uh, I am standardizing to zero, the gap at the, in the year before birth, there is no much difference prior to birth up to five years. After birth, uh, up to 15 years, you see an opening of the gap that actually is, is more pronounced during the first 10 years and then stabilizes after that. And the difference in terms of percentage times uh, is about 20% when uh, the individuals get to the you know, stabilizing phase. Actually, you know, by coincidence, it's almost exactly the same as the opening of the gender pay gap. Uh, I, I could show you, because I think this is interesting, <coughs> that these, and I've been asked frequently about it in the past, this is not related to changing home. There is a lot of moving home in the data, uh, mostly happening prior to the birth of the first child, and then dropping very considerably once the child is born. So it could be that, in part, it's motivated by uh, the, the, the employment of women and where the jobs are located. But when we look at the reasons for why uh, the women give to have, mo have moved home uh, in the past uh, year, what they say is that, well, they are mostly related to family reasons and housing reasons. These are these two lines in all graphs. The ones that are related to distance to work, which is one of the uh, potential options that they could uh, answer, is effectively zero in all cases. And when we also look at the changes in commuting time uh, among women who moved since last interview and move, uh, women who did not move since last interview, we don't see any pattern actually, uh, any uh, differences in terms, uh, in terms of these variables. So we don't think that it's related to moving home. It's something different. Okay, um, so if indeed uh, uh, mothers put more weight in, uh, on their job location uh, and restrict the labor market, the, the, the dimension of the labor market where they are uh, willing to accept a job offer, then 
we predict that one, uh, they may be more prone to drop jobs who are farther away from uh, where they live uh, that they have had prior to childbirth. They may be willing to accept a, a wage cut to move uh, closer to home and they may be less uh, likely uh, to find a good match for their skills and so they may be experiencing um, job mis uh, skill mismatch uh, when they move jobs. And so what I'm going to do is to show you evidence of each of these three, um, of the, uh, each of these three mechanisms. So first I'm starting with employment uh, and commuting, addressing the first one. And uh, these uh, numbers here show uh, some of the uh, results from a well, regression model uh, where I am looking at the employment post-birth uh, in the first 10 years. I can change this, um, you know, the, 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 the duration uh, of the time that I uh, consider without actually affecting these results. <coughs> So I'm considering these 10 first years uh, after birth and I'm regressing that on, uh, for mothers who were working prior to birth, which are most, most of them. Uh, I'm regressing that on uh, the commuting time uh, that they had in the year before birth. Um, and I'm controlling for the wages uh, that they had pre-birth. And what I see is that there is a, a, a statistically significant at, well, 1% or 5% level uh, in all cases uh, of pre-birth commuting time on employment. What we see in particular is that mothers who were working further away in terms of minutes uh, are more likely to drop out of uh, employment and to be out of work after birth. And how large and small is this effect? What it, what it says is that a 10 minute increase uh, in commuting time pre-birth makes these mothers more, uh, less likely to be in employment by two percentage points uh, after birth. Okay, so they are less likely to, uh, to work after birth, but uh, what happens when they move back into work? Okay, so what I'm looking here is on, uh, uh, is to the um, employment rights. No, it's not. So what I'm looking here is to the jobs uh, that uh, um, these women find uh, after having interrupted a job during the first five years of their, um, of their uh, uh, period after birth. So I'm taking women who uh, either change or, um, or, uh, um, or are out of work during the first five years uh, of their um, Pre, uh, post birth period, so while the, ch uh, the child is in um, pre primary school. And then I'm looking at the next 10 years of their life, so when the child is aged 6 to 15, and I'm considering uh, when they move into the first job after that, what is the distance, uh, what is the effect, uh, um, what is uh, the, um, uh, the difference in the commuting time that uh, we observe. And so what I see is <coughs> that mothers who took time away from work are moving into jobs who are much closer to their home once they move back in uh, by in between three minutes and six minutes in one go. While mothers who move directly from job to job without taking time off work, they uh, will uh, be working uh, at you know, a non-statistically significant difference uh, from uh, what they were before. So these numbers here show that it is mothers who take time away from home, sorry, from work, who in moving back into, their, uh, into work are going to move uh, to uh, closer my jobs. So it's on the one hand, if you're uh, working further away and you have a child, you're more likely to move out. Once you move in, you move to jobs which are closer by. Sorry. So this is what we find in terms of employment, which sort of, uh, um, which confirms uh, sort of what our ex expectations. What about wages uh, and commuting? So here we look at uh, the wage premium uh, in terms of commuting for all women and then we interact uh, with having a child. So what we see is that jobs who are far away pay more. Uh, pay more my, uh, uh, in terms of minutes, uh, 10 minutes uh, increase in the distance for all women increases wages by about two percentage points. But for mothers actually the effect is larger. 
For mothers, uh, 10 minutes in commuting time actually uh, is associated with uh, uh, higher wages of, in about, of about four percentage points. Now, what this means is that mothers uh, who are willing to work far, they are willing to work far only against a pay premium, which we, uh, we measure as being four percentage points by 10 minutes uh, of uh, commuting time. So further wage jobs indeed seem to open uh, the possibility of uh, wages uh, that are, of jobs that are better paid, essentially. The effect is smaller if as the child uh, grows older. <coughs> So what can we do now? Okay, so let's think about um, the, uh, these mothers who change jobs. And I'm now going to compare the change in the wage that we observe from the job that they had pre-birth with the wage that they had, the first wage that they have in a new job after birth. And, and I'm contrasting that change in wage with the change in commuting time. And uh, here I'm going to control for age, region, and education. Now, the number of observations here is going to be very small because, uh, because we are only looking at that change around childbirth. And so I'm putting the, the three education groups together, uh, but I'm controlling for education, and I'm controlling in this column here for the characteristics of the job that they had pre-birth. And what we see is that the change in commuting time is again very positively associated now with a change in wage. Uh, increase in commuting time leads to an increase in wage, but on the reverse side of the medal, which is what we typically have, is that a drop in the commuting time is going to uh, be associated with a drop in uh, the wage rate that uh, these mothers gain. And the, the size of these effects are that a 10 minute drop in the commuting time, so moving in by 10 minutes is going to have a three to five percentage points, is going to be associated with a three to five percentage points drop in the white rate. So it seems to be that indeed, mothers moving, mothers uh, uh, working far, they are more likely to drop out of the, uh, their jobs. They are, more, um, they are more likely to then take up a job which is closer by and their job which is closer by is also a job that pays less. Okay, so what, in t uh, what can we say then in terms of the type of jobs that they get? Okay, so to, to try to get at this skill mismatch, we need to understand what is the type of occupations that they now uh, are going to get into. And to do that, what I'm going to do is to merge into the, uh, our, my BHPS USOC data information from the ONET. Now, the ONET, for those of you who do not know, uh, data is actually on uh, a US, um, is data on US classification of occupations, uh, collected from both workers and occupation analysts, which tries to characterize the characteristics of occupations in various dimensions. Uh, we have a cross, um, uh, a cross path to, um, to, 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 to transfer this information into occupations uh, in the UK and use the various dimensions under which uh, the, um, uh, this data classifies the occupations to construct an index of occupation uh, complexity in this case. Now, this index of occupation complexity is ac was actually proposed in the literature uh, by uh, uh, Keynes uh, and others in 2017. There are alternative uh, ways of synthesizing essentially the information on the ONET. We have actually tried with other alternatives and the results don't change very much. Uh, although, you know, we can think about other characteristics of jobs and therefore, uh, and this will reflect different, uh, different patterns. But for this sort of um, measure, which is going to reflect a complexity of the job, which is essentially associated with the cognitive content of jobs. Uh, the results uh, from this measure and other alternative measures were very similar. Okay, so what do we do? This index of job complexity is essentially the first principal component of uh, a PCA uh, analysis uh, on a subset of ONET descriptors, uh, attributes uh, of the occupations, and these occupations are at, at a four digit level, so they are very detailed, uh, which are taken from uh, a set, the set of attributes that characterize the workers' abilities that is required by the occupations, the skill content of the occupations, and the work activities that that occupation entails. Okay? And by worker abilities, it could, you know, there are various. One of them is a written expression, the other one is originality, the other one is uh, 
uh, mathematical um, skills, actually here, sorry, in skills. The other is critical thinking for the skills. Uh, for working activities, we have, we have things like making decisions and solving problems, etc. Okay, so we essentially take all these measures together, we construct this one-dimensional uh, measure uh, of uh, the characteristics of the occupations that the mothers have, and we, you know, just um, to, to give you an idea, a high-complexity occupation could be like a physicist, architect, uh, and the low-complexity uh, occupation could be a caretaker, a window cleaner, and so on. So it, it, it does have uh, m more to do with the cognitive content of the occupation than, say, with the manual with the skills that it requires. Okay, so just to give you an idea, these are uh, some very brief descriptors of um, the, this complexity measure. Uh, it is as a, a gradient, a significant gradient with education, as you expect, although there is a quite an overlap in terms of the range uh, of the occupations by, um, by education. And this is when we, uh, it, this is taken uh, from uh, the match of this um, occupation variable with the uh, occupation uh, descriptor that you have um, in the BHPS USOC data. By the way, just, um, just for clarity, we have normalized this measure to be in the zero one interval and therefore you should all, um, we should uh, interpret these values uh, to be on that range. Okay, so if I take this measure as being uh, one uh, key measure uh, describing occupations, what can I see in terms of what happens over the life cycle for men, occupations that men and women take? And again, this is super similar to what we observe uh, with the wages. We have men's um, profiles here in blue growing healthily over the life cycle. So men progress to occupations that are more complex. While women, uh, women tend to, well, in particular for these two educational groups, to progress over the first 10 years and then stabilize. They don't move up this occupational ladder any longer. If we look at the gender, pay, uh, sorry, at the, the gap in occupation complexity, then again, uh, what we see is that there is uh, much less of a movement prior uh, to the birth of the first child, uh, but then there is an opening uh, of the, the gap as the child arrives and with women uh, taking on occupations which are comparatively uh, less um, complex than those that men take. So very much uh, in line uh, with what we had before. So, but of course, what we ask is, well, is this, uh, is this measure of occupation uh, complexity related with uh, the, the wages um, uh, that uh, men and women, well, that women have? And uh, these uh, um, regressions here, th these coefficients of the regressions here, which control for other things like, you know, at the age, the, the experience that these individuals have, um, uh, and the tenure on the job and so on, uh, just show that job complexity is actually a very strong determinant of the wages uh, of women. Not only that it's a determinant of the levels, but also if we look at the first differences in wages, so the growth uh, in wage rates, job complexity is also associated uh, with higher growth rates, in particular for the more educated individuals where um, um, a change in job complexity is actually associated with a strong change in, uh, um, in the wage rate uh, of women. Okay, so what happens to mothers? Well, what happens to mothers when we look at how they progress through the complexity of the jobs as compared with other women is that they progress much less. In particular, again, if they are uh, of the more educated type. So mothers, compared with other women, progress through the ladder of job complexity slower, essentially. And again, if you look at uh, what happens around childbirth, comparing um, the complexity of the job, first job, first new job they have after childbirth with the uh, last job they had prior to childbirth, and now contrast it uh, with uh, the commuting time, what you see is that, again, there is a very positive relationship uh, with this commuting time, which means that just as for wages, mothers who move jobs um, and 
reduced their commuting time, now are moving to jobs that not only are lower paid, they are also jobs of a lower complexity level. So they are moving to jobs that don't match their skills to the same extent. It's also true that the more they are away from work, the stronger uh, the uh, drop in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the complexity of the job, the new jobs that they take. Uh, and so, as we had before, it's these mothers who move in, oh, sorry, who move out, they work further away, move out, then they stay out of, the, the, of work for some time, and then move in, they are going uh, to, um, to be penalized in terms of the complexity of the jobs that they are going to take, and these can have long-term consequences for their wages. Okay, and so I'm uh, actually um, finishing up just by summarizing. So I think I've shown you evidence that uh, commuting time is an important consideration when we want uh, to try uh, to understand how the careers of women shape around childbirth. Uh, we have sh I've shown you that commuting time is small, or it's short generally, but it's not insignificant uh, in t when we compare with, um, with time in work, and that there is a uh, pay premium uh, for commuting, that is, jobs that are further away seem to pay more than jobs that are closer by, partly potentially because uh, individuals don't choose equally between uh, jobs that are further away uh, and uh, are uh, closer by. So they, they take into the consideration the cost of traveling when uh, they decide about what the, their reservation wage for accepting a job is. But for mothers in particular, we found that uh, they work within a narrower radius from home than other women, and that uh, by doing this, they are more likely to stop working if they work uh, further away when they are um, um, pre-birth. And yet, they, when they move back, they are more likely to move back to jobs uh, which are closer to their home, which pay less, and which are also uh, of a lower level in terms of their complexity. So uh, they are likely to move down in the skill ladder, essentially. Thank you very much.